All right, welcome back everyone to Sneaker Impact News. I'm your host, Brian the Botanist, and today I have a very special guest, Terrence Diggs, the founder of D17 Clothing. Terrence, what's up? Uh, it's it's going today, a lovely Tuesday. I'm happy we finally were able to get on an interview. And we got the boxes too. That's what I'm yep. happy for. <laughs> Matching Sneaker Impact collection boxes. And Terrence <laughs> is our friend, a Baltimore area-based designer, entrepreneur, and ASICS ambassador. Most notably, making his mark as the owner of lifestyle and sportswear brand D17. Terrence has become a visionary of how to combine one's passion with a keen sense of creativity and marketing. From sports, culture, the arts, and philanthropy, he's done it all and been featured in Complex Magazine, Shopify, and Midstrike Magazine. Terrence, we're just excited to have you on, learn. I was watching some of your past podcasts and just really excited to hear about your journey and how you're getting involved with as I said earlier, off the call with you, athletics, design, and community. How's it going today? Where are you calling from? Right now, I'm just in my, I guess you could say home studio in Maryland. Okay. I recently just got back from Florida. So I've been bumping around here and there, trying to get stuff together for the end of the year. And here we are. We're getting ready for the Baltimore Running Festival. So that's where my training is going for the next, I guess you could say, 60 days. I'm doing the half marathon this year. I did the 10K for two years. This will be my first half marathon and we're ready to get things going. That's awesome, man. I want to hear about your running journey. And But first, you were born and raised in Baltimore. Tell us about your family. How is Baltimore and your family your identity? Yeah. So I guess like super big for me, my grandfather was pretty, as you could say, known like in the area as a historian for black history in Baltimore County and Baltimore City. So always being around him taught me how to chase your dreams. He was a military guy for a long time, he was a substitute teacher, retired and started writing books for 30 years. It was this thing that he wanted to do and he took it as far as he could and he got deemed with the nickname, the Godfather of Black History in Baltimore County. So I've been following his footsteps in a way and chasing my own dreams. And I definitely grew up in a very like computer techie, like creative family. Like my uncle's a cartoonist, my grandmother, she was like a crochet, embroidery, I guess you could say artist. My mother worked in advertising and media buying for a long time. When it comes to kids, I say, hey, I was on the computer playing like space astronauts. I was on the computer doing like Corel Painter when I was <laughs> like four Design or five years old. Like yeah. yeah, like I was definitely the one like in school trying to make stuff in like Microsoft where like, hey, come to lunch. I'm doing 10 cent portraits and stuff like that, wow. <laughs> trying to like make apple juice money and stuff like that. Yeah. And over time, like obviously I've been in the area, I've worked with musicians, I've worked with rappers, I've worked with brands on anything creative wise. And now I'm at the point where I said, hey, I'd like to start my own brand. And that's how D17 came about. And we're about seven years in since I started. It was like literally last day of like my college graduation. I did it like wow. two days before I walked across the stage. I was like, That's I'm going to cool. start a brand. And here we are. So got to love it. Incredible. How did it start professionally? Did you start in the sneaker head industry? Yeah. So I've always really just been into sneakers and shoes and fashion. Just being like in Maryland, obviously we grew up under armors right down the street. So that's, okay. that's huge growing up. Obviously so many of the schools and institutions always wearing under armor or people wearing Nike foam posits or New Balance or Asics and stuff like that. So it's always mm -hmm. been like in the underbelly of just what you've seen from playing sports, like a lot of time, that was really my intro to fashion. People getting the jackets, they're wearing Jordan 11s before mm -hmm. the game or like going to the game. And I remember being in the audience and seeing everybody wearing the bread 11s before the night they came out, they're wearing them mm -hmm. the next day just to show off and stuff like that. It's just yeah. always been around me. And my grandmother always said, if you want to be a, a decent man, you got to have decent shoes. So uh -huh. I was just like, <laughs> that always yeah. like rings in my head. I think she would be somewhat proud of my gigantic sneaker collection that's sitting <laughs> behind the camera that I get yelled at for a lot of times. It makes me some money. <laughs> yeah. So there's so many topics I want to explore with you, but let's start off with the design world. 
and what type of opportunities have come your way, how you've progressed in design? Yeah, I mean, definitely, I guess you could say more or less the beginning half of like my design career, I was working with like my friend Kasim. he was a really amazing rapper in the the DMV area. We were able to create cover arts, posters, album art that rolled on into collaborations with bigger venues like the Fillmore or an Echo Stage and stuff like that. And what's cool when you get the call from Live Nation and they're saying like, hey, we need you to put together a press release or a press flyer for this person, this rapper and going from there mm-hmm. and then rolling that on into what I was doing at A6. So I worked on the sports style side, which is like the lifestyle, streetwear, stuff like that. We did collaboration, a lot of direction for Kith. We did it for Denim Tears. We did it for the Olympics with the athletes and what they're wearing on the, the track and stuff like that. I've done both sides, both the practical, just being on the computer, also like creative direction, social media expertise. And going Mm -hmm. from there, I've seen it all from the photography to e-com to what it looks like on social, what it looks like on digital. I'm at the point where I say I'm like a curator of like digital experience, I guess you could say, because everything all ties back together, not only from the design side, but I'd say from the analytics as well. When you're actually learning like how the the business of sneakers and fashion actually works, there's still Mm -hmm. businesses, there's still profit margins and stuff like that, but we have to be able to make those creative decisions to push culture forward. You can make a crazy looking design that could change the world. A Supreme logo was just future in a box and it's still living on to this yeah. day. So it's the way it goes. Sure. So I want to talk about how you transitioned to D17 from being a hired designer. What does D17 represent? What type of services do you provide? I know it's a streetwear, but also a sportswear company that is a lifestyle apparel. So tell us what type of services and how you got that started. Yeah. So pretty much I would say around 2000, I was originally just doing the brand just, Hey, this is something me and my friends would like, let's make shirts and hoodies and Mm -hmm. wear them to to the bar or whatever, stuff like that. But over time, obviously demand begins to grow and you're like, okay, there's now the people of people that are interested in the products and it's okay. I think I have something here. And then Mm -hmm. over time, obviously being able to be in the, like in the space, it's okay. You have to innovate. You have to do something. You can get a t-shirt from anywhere. What's going to make our value proposition or what makes the business Mm -hmm. what it is. And then we got down to really honing that in to our three like mission statement, athletics, design, community, which is really just utilizing the power of sport and design to flourish within the communities that we serve, whether that's grassroots, whether that's big professional teams. We've worked with my local high school. We've worked with my local college. We've worked with minor league baseball teams. We've worked with profession, the higher major league teams, being able just to create product and bring out event activation and just community engagement. Uh, it just makes things cool. And it's really a lot of awareness, which is where the running kind of came in, which we didn't really start until I would say 2018, 2019. Um, and that was just something that I was already doing on my own. And I was like, hey, um, this is before I, I understood the concepts of run clubs. I was just okay. like, I'm going to be the phenomenon, able to. Yeah. yeah, I was like, I'm a, I, I played a lot of sports in high school. I played golf. I played lacrosse. I ran track. I played basketball. But running was always something that kind of was the conditioning. It was the punishment for not doing something in sports. And I was like, how can I yeah. learn to do this and make it enjoyable and, and show the access of it to the communities that I'm around. And I remember a lot of people, I was like, I'm going to start a run club. They're like, you're freaking crazy. Like why, who wants to do that? Now everyone's calling me saying, when's the next run club event? So it's crazy how the world just shifts in yeah. that direction. I'm not mad at it. I'm glad more people are taking up the sport. It's just more or less, I want people to be doing it correctly. Please do not show up in a pair of Air Force Ones and then complain that your Achilles are hurting for the next three days. It's let's get more of the access and information for equipment, events, and stuff like that to make sure that you're running at your peak and you still look great while you're doing it. So tell us about D17 as a run brand versus a clothing brand. Do you have organized weekly runs? Do you have, where do you run and do you run in Baltimore? 
Yeah. So we split time between Baltimore and Columbia, Maryland. Okay. We've been thankful enough to work with Feet First Sports in yeah, Columbia, Maryland. Yeah, we love Maryland. Feet First. I was about to mention Nak- Nakia. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's Funny fact, she's actually the one that introduced me to getting the box because they have one. Oh my God. The Nakia there. and Feet yeah. First in, in yeah, Columbia. To them. So usually we run with them That's on awesome. Thursdays as well as we've had the opportunity to work with Charm City Run, which is like one of the yep. biggest retailers out here. Right. Yeah, we've been working with them for their Charles Street 12 miler, oh, leading wow. some of the preview runs and stuff like that. We do on the D17 side, we hold usually like bi-weekly track workouts. Usually we'll run around the various lakes that are in the community. That's where people are like, oh, if you challenged all the lakes that are, they're, they're huge and beautiful. Now we're getting together like our teams and everything to be competing in a lot of the races. Like I mentioned off the call, we're we're getting ready for the Baltimore Running Festival. We'll probably get a team of about 12 to 15 runners together represented in each one of the events. We'll have our team kits now produced by D17. I want to see those. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to be, they'll be cool. Like it'll be our first introduction, but once I get that out the way, I'm just going to turn it up like tenfold. And thankfully with ASICS being an ambassador, we've been able to get people correctly in the right shoes. We've been able to okay. get people in, get them out. No disrespect to the Nikes, but we get no. them out of the Air Force Ones into- Do you have a special relationship where they, you recommend an ASIC shoe? Because for instance, I do train in the um, Nova Blast 4, mm-hmm. and I just find that it works good for me because I have really long-term Achilles tendonitis, and I had surgery mm-hmm. about four months ago. And just that was a shoe even before surgery that felt best for me, but I've worn other shoes and I've raced in other shoes, but do they need to have a pair of ASICs to be part of the club? <laughs> or are you guys pretty, I, I know I'll, that there's, and you have, you're an ASICs ambassador. So I would respect that you are promoting them because you believe I've, yeah, that's awesome. So tell us a little bit more about how the shoes work and how. It's all good. Any, anybody that comes to the runs, you do not need to be wearing ASICs to participate in the runs. I okay. may have, I may have to cover them in the picture just because I'm a brand loyalist and I just. Yep. But, oh, you're a designer too. That's probably pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. But uh, photo shoots where they tape up shoes. Yeah. I gotta love it. Gotta love it. But no, usually what we try to do, especially now is over the time that running has really given in terms of building relationships. We always say, hey, go to Feet First beforehand or go to Charm City beforehand and get yourself analyzed. Get a gate analysis, yeah. Yeah, don't just try to buy something that's not gonna work for you. So then they'll find out if they're neutral or they pronate. And yeah, I'd much rather get people outfitted correctly versus trying to my bias. And now obviously I'm going to push, I'm going to push for the A6 models. um, Yeah, what are some of your favorites to wear personally? I know we're going to get into a favorite section in a little bit, but we're talking running right now. So just yeah, in the wrong category. Yeah. I'm a big, I'm a big super blast guy, which I have okay. to in the background. I haven't Not- been blessed to try those yet. I'm dreaming the day I get to try the super blast tells me about them, but I've never yeah. tried them yet. I usually yeah. just keep them with the bag. I like the magic speeds, honestly, for any track workouts oh. and pretty much just, I like the Kayano 31s. I have gigantic duck feet. So okay. I'm able to have big super- toe box. Yeah, I need a lot of stability, so I try to go with that. But yeah, if you come to the club, you don't need to wear the A6. I would love if you got into them, but they've definitely been able to help. Just bring people together. If there's any events, I always just try to invite people. Hey, they're hosting the Summer Grit Party with Believe in the Run. Oh, we're doing this down in Virginia Beach with uh, with Spark Worldwide. We're doing trying to just like circumventing everyone around, Mm -hmm. not just for the brand, but also just for the sport in general. Just being able to get people excited and just show what's been there all this time. I didn't know. I didn't even know myself. So how long have you been part of the ASICS family and, and how did that develop? Technically, since 2019, when I used to wow. be on the corporate side, more or less, I knew a lot about the ASIC stuff before I, I joined on the corporate side. More or less, I was just like me getting a job there. And I was like, holy crap, this is like the greatest thing ever. You were in the street uh, kind of more category. Yeah, I was on the, life- that li- the lifestyle. Yeah, I was on the lifestyle side, but I did work on a couple of As a designer, did you help with social media, many different hats or? Mainly social media, social social media media management, but I did do a lot of like content management for the performance run stuff, like the light show campaigns, like a lot of the Kayanos, one of the earlier Cumulus and a Nimbus. I was on some of those just like- 
Yeah, <laughs> gotta because love. I actually have those right behind me. That's the Nimbus right. that I got at Run Summit from ASICS when we cleaned up. We we do a plogging mission with them and the Low Impact Alliance, and they give you. Yeah. They gave me a pair of Nova Blast in Chicago last year at mm. Runcella, and then it got rebranded Run Summit, and they helped us out this year with the Low Impact Alliance. We got a pair of Nimbus. Gotta love it. Yeah, and they but... did the, the product testing of the Super Bla- or the Nova Blast, but um, yeah. It's the way to go. They get involved with a lot of things, and so do many shoe brands. We're not, we love every everyone that gets involved in sustainability. Yeah, we're not I, just going to speak about Asics, but I, I your time there, I think that must be invaluable to your to your to do what you're doing at these seventeen, and also just the fact that you're a loyal collaborator with them. Yours is huge for the run community. Each yeah, definitely. group has a backing of some sort, so it's great to have some backing there from. And what's going on with them naturally you guys can pair up with them so anything else you want to share about the d17 run and asics and what's going on lately in baltimore just really just anything about coming out and just enjoying it we've been trying to figure out what we're gonna see what the future is gonna look like i know Mm -hmm. now I've been trying to push doing D17 events in Florida. We try to do one okay. in Jackson. We try to do one in Jacksonville. Back in June, I'm looking to get down to South Beach in December. Dude, we can set it up. Have you met Frankie Ruiz yet? I have not. Okay, well, he's the first person we're going to introduce you to with the Beach Run Club, Brickle Run Club. He's the founder Tell- of the Miami founder Miami Marathon. He's a Nike yeah. coach. He has the top high school team in the country. Belen Jesuit, he's a cross country coach. They're like state champions for the last 20 years straight. He's the man down here. He's also my colleague at Sneaker Impact. So before you do anything in South Beach, let me connect yeah, you to I, the godfather of Miami running. I need I'm not to gonna give him too much of a shot. He gets the shot. He's on one of our original episodes, episode one. Um, he'll be back in the future. He's a great guy and he will connect you with him and it'll be the, he'll get you connect. He'll get the run club behind you to come out and we're, yeah, we're doing stuff with other people like Joe Robinson from We Run Three One Three came down for the Miami. Nice. Mar- come down for Miami Marathon too, by the way. Yeah, the that's the plan because yeah. we're doing some stuff down there at Dolphin Mall. I'm hoping okay. like on the retail side. That There's is a ton well. of malls. Yeah, yeah, we've been we've had a couple of connections down there, and I, like I said, I've been going in and out, and I'm hopefully my goal yeah. is to relocate down there, down to South Beach. That would be awesome. We'd love to have you here. It's like look, Austin. It's one of the fastest growing places in the U.S., I, I think. But. Look, I don't want to throw it out there. I know my yeah. jersey's in the back. I didn't mean to. I actually was doing Oh, I see the heat hat on. We haven't talked here. about that yet. Yeah. I've been a Miami guy since birth. So I feel like my yeah. my life plan was to get down there. I've been okay. big on them since Just everything 1990s. Happened. I was a, an Alonzo Mourning fan, and he went to Georgetown. And I remember watching him when I was in, in the 90s when I was in high school at Georgetown. Yeah, he was amazing. My family was always big Georgetown yeah. people. And sure. I'm a Wasn't uh, Anthony Hardaway from there too? Yeah, and I'm a, big, I'm a big Dwayne Wade fanatic. Wisconsin, where I'm from? Yeah, I was a obsessed with him and then everything going down there. I've been in the city. I was down there last when the heat, they played the Celtics. Then when they played the Nuggets. So that was Mm -hmm. the the previous finals. And I was like, yeah, I'm like really liking it down here. This is more than just like TNT. So between there, yeah, yeah, Wynwood, I'm trying to get a mural done. You would fit in so well down here. You would always have Baltimore as your home, but Miami has such a vibrant art scene. It's ridiculous. And the fashion scene, we interviewed Martu Freeman, Mm -hmm. a Parker with MEF Productions, and she works with Mana Fashion Services. The fashion Mm -hmm. scene is just booming down here. New York artists moving down here. The sports scene is booming. The um, music scene, every scene, the environmental scene, the running scene. The running scene is huge. I could tell you about the running scene all day and there's mm-hmm. all brands getting involved and influencers. It's really cool. So yeah, I've been waiting for my time. We would welcome you with open arms, man. You'd be part of the sneaker impact circle here, man. We could come in and do podcasts regularly here, but oh. yeah, so that's, it's incredible. The work just to hear with ASICs, how you get that experience. And then with your with the run community up there and everything you guys are training for sounds like Baltimore. If you're, if people are interested, how do they join your run clubs? Do they, do you find them through word of mouth mainly or do they Instagram? It's a lot of Instagram, a lot of obviously just like Strava posts. Everyone gets to see those, but like most of it, I will say it comes from just like word of mouth. It's really just getting out there and not to sound cliche, but you have to get out there and really go run. Yeah. Yeah, Like I've even jumped around to a couple of other run clubs that are like in the city, big ones, small ones, just 
pulling up and just being like, hey, like we're all encompassing the same space here. Mm-hmm. Let's all just just now, we all see each other, see each all, other. Yeah. Yeah. We all see each other when it comes to the events, whether in they're in Baltimore or in D.C. or yeah. if I'm on the road, whether it's like down in Charlotte or in Atlanta, it's like we've all connected at some point and then you you end up bumping into each other like at the runs yeah. like the sure. races and you're like yep. i don't know you you don't know me i definitely saw you in detroit you definitely saw me <laughs> at tre we have never said anything together but we keep ending up in the same spaces so totally. let's try to build some type of rapport then you find out it's oh i work at brooks i work at yep. solomon or adidas or oh i used to I was in a Nike campaign. That's, that's crazy. So it's, it's wild how large the community is, both domestically and globally. But it's also crazy just how it can be someone that's just like a one of one connection. I've met so many people just from running in general. At first, sure. when I was I hated it. Now I'm just like it's such a world. It's such yeah. a world of its own. It's people. Some people call it a sickness when they get too obsessive about their running. Um, yeah, your parties and you can't say the word running. Oh yeah, N- now it's like the taboo thing. It's oh my goodness, he's here he's surrounded about by running. Yeah, yeah. can't talk about running. I've been at parties like that, big and small parties, where people are just boycott the word running because they want to talk about other things. Yeah, I'm sure, bo- it's like that in the fashion world too, right? Oh yeah, if it's anything, the fashion is always design. just like so many trends, and it's we're all rocking with this, we're not rocking with this no more. We're all wearing this, we're not wearing this anymore. So it's crazy mm-hmm. with the fashion and the running, especially with Asics, because me growing up, like I've been around Asics, but when I ran track, Asics was what you wore. That was like like the first inclination. It was either a pair of Asics or a pair of New Balances. Those are just the go-to brands for- Yeah, that was the the go-to. And like a lot of friends that I had, we were running track or cross country. They were like, we just wear specifically Asics and Feet First has been around since like the 60s. And they still have the original like Asics benches and stuff like that from when they first opened. So I was already- in tune to it, but it wasn't like on the fashion side. But now ASICS is like going up on the fashion side and it's, man, they've got performance, they've got lifestyle, but so many sure. people are still like, they're still making their ways, but it's crazy to see how that balance and synergy is happening. And they're in- a Japanese company, correct? <laughs> yes, they are. Yeah. I used to wear the hyperspeeds back in the day in oh, the yeah. city marathon in like 2010. Ryan Hall is a huge, I'm a huge fan of his. My, I got to hang out with him a couple of times and take him to the airport when I was a chaperone for a race he was an ambassador for that I helped produce and sushi together and frozen yogurt. And Are you familiar with him and his wife, Sarah? I think I am. She's the a name, current name Olympian. Is. He's a former Olympian. Yeah. Yeah, they, think, yeah. Ryan was set the American record for the marathon. Oh, wow. At one point, the half, uh, definitely the half and under 50, not under 50, 59, I believe. Anyways, this was back in the 2010s mm-hmm. and he was in several Olympics and won the Olympic trials several times. And now his wife, Sarah, he's a bodybuilder now. And his wife, Sarah Hall, is she wasn't competing in Paris, but she's always mm-hmm. at the world champs and she's a top. Yeah, I think I actually. She's a, she's a big ASICS ambassador for the running. Yeah. Her and Ryan are like lifetime um reps or not reps. What am I trying to say? Yeah. I, I think I've worked with Sarah. If the not Hall steps foundation too, which I yeah. got to run the um, Boston marathon for one year. So yeah. Doing great things. They adopted, you heard they're the ones they adopted five, four to five Ethiopian sisters from a orphanage oh, wow. because they never have their own kids that they are a young couple that in their thirties that still mm-hmm. want to be, they adopted five sisters, which is an incredible story from all their trips to Ethiopia. So I just, to give it, when I think ASICs, I think Ryan Hall and Sarah Hall. Mm-hmm. And now I'm also going to think Terrence Diggs. Woo! It's like not- <laughs> no, but I was looking you up earlier today and yesterday preparing for our podcast. And I love your initiative that you reached out to us as a fan of the brand. And I want to talk a little bit about how Sneaker Impact has gotten involved with your world. Mm-hmm. And then I want to talk a little bit about psychology. So let's go ahead with Sneaker Impact first. <laughs> yeah, um, how did you meet Sneaker Impact? And what do you think about the sustainability movement? Yeah. So that kind of like ties back with feet first when I was going in and out of the store. Like I said, when I was first introduced more into run specialty, because like I said, I was, I probably was five minutes away from Charm City Run. And I was like, ah, they're just a run store. It's whatever. But when I went into feet first, I saw the sneaker impact collection box. I was like, 
this is interesting. I never really knew what this was. And I kept looking at it and I was like, huh, let me look more into this, obviously, as the QR code. So I scanned it. And the same thing that a lot of people, especially in the sneaker world, but like Mm -hmm. myself in the fashion world, fashion can become very wasteful. It's a lot of sampling. It's a lot of unused material. It's a lot of, yeah, the shipping, fright, plane emissions. It's a lot of, it's a lot of pieces that go into it. And when I sat back and I thought about it, not only from the running side, but as well, just from the material side, we started working with a lot of artists that do upcycling of a lot of old inventory that we have. Instead of just not knowing what to do with it, let's turn it into something else. We've done that with two of our running jackets. We turned them into one of one running hats, which is cool. cool. So we repurposed yeah. all the material, all the 3M, all the mesh, all the polyester. Oh, that's a great idea. Backing. Yeah. So it's kind of it's kind of cool, especially for like sizes that don't sell or something like that. Mm-hmm. And then once we got to, or at least myself, getting more into the running space, it's man, I buy a lot of shoes. And then once they're done, it's they go through the evolution for me. It's I'm running yeah. in them a lot. I might race in them. I train a lot. They might get messed up in the rain one time. They then become my slip-on when I go to the grocery store shoe. <laughs> now they're just yeah. like. And I don't want to just throw them away. And they become uh, gardening shoes. Yeah. They, they're just like, I'm going to go run in the dirt or something like that, or my trail trial shoes. Dog and then being shoes, able, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And then being able to connect with you guys at Sneaker Impact, I was like, this is yeah. the main way that not only myself, but the people that come to events and stuff, they always tell me, they're like, man, I have stuff that's just sitting around and I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. I'd much rather see it have a second life or being able to create that impact in a way that's personally fulfilling, but it also is giving something of the lifetime of the shoe. Because like I said, it's sneakers that you can collect a lot. You may never wear them. You may wear them a lot, but then it's also, what do we do after them? Because after a certain period of time, if they're too beat up, they're just there. You can't use them anymore. Let's put them to good use. Yeah, most people don't think about what happens to a lot of things when you're done with it. We had a cleanup um, organization on here the other day, Miami Beach Cleanup, and they're huge. And and they clean up uh, the tourists and also people who aren't mindful. It's like until you start to really think about what happens to a cup when you're done with it or what happens to a shoe. And there's a big billions amount of shoes produced each year. I forget the number now, if it's 14 billion or if it's I forget, I think it's 13 to 14 billion are created mm-hmm. and 9 billion are thrown away. In the U- US, 400 million are thrown away a year, which is mm-hmm. 80% of the shoes. Only 13% yeah. get recycled. So we're just up against a staggering statistic. We're a social enterprise and I'm so excited for the next time you come to Miami to come see our operations and to meet our founder and to see the people that work here and the jobs that are created locally in Little Haiti, where we're located in Miami and also in other countries like Haiti and Honduras are the two countries we ship the most shoes to. We have some mandates, like we don't grind any shoes that have a second life. We do have a grinding program, material circularity right now. We're working to get very high purity levels so that we can create new shoes from old shoes and other products from the old shoes because they're separating the foams down to each type of foam and rubber yeah, down to a purity level of 95%. So then it can get re- injected and the way that they create the products they need a very high quality so we have that program going we also have the upcycling program where we have fashion designers and entrepreneurs the fashion designers are helping to enhance the shoe repair them and they also enhance them sometimes and make them very stylish yeah and show them how to like if they're going to repair a shoe make it have some really cool type of or just how to make it look as professional as possible and Mm -hmm. they're repairing shoes that most people would consider junk and as long as someone can walk in them, they may have a second life. Um, they're not necessarily for running, but the staggering statistics are what we're up against. And we're a brand that cares a lot. And I know when we talked earlier about design, it's all about the brand, right? Which is, mm-hmm. and about the mission. And I really believe in sneaker impact because as an environmentalist and a runner, I just think it's something that the discussion needs to get out and we're getting it out there now. In the last three years, we've only been around for three or four years and Mm -hmm. we're really a lot of great run clubs are getting involved and cities around the U.S. and stores and marathons. And so we're just trying to get the eyes and ears that it's a free program and that we can provide you with the sustainability metrics like the carbon emissions you're saving per shoe, 
the amount of waste we're diverting from landfills through your efforts and just the shoes, how many shoes and just, we pay for the shipping both ways. We're handling over 40,000 to 70,000 shoes a day at our facility here in Miami, mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands a month. So you have to just come see it to believe it. And yeah, I, I didn't understand I where shoes to. went until I started working here. I didn't really understand until I saw the huge containers and how much Miami generates in the U.S. It's just a huge amount. It's mind boggling. So there has to be shipping companies that get involved and big brands. And that's where we're hoping some brands like ASICs and other ones we've talked to on that they will get more. They are getting involved. Now it's a part. Now we all just want a partnership up so that it can be helpful to make it easier for people, I think, too. Yeah. And I feel and after the battle, I've, I've learned as well. Anytime I take one of the boxes with me, like when we go to the track and stuff, is really just asking. Sometimes people, they just don't know. It's just, hey, sure. if you, what are you doing with your old stuff? Even I was, even I didn't yeah. know when I was first getting into running, like I've always kept a lot of the shoes and it's not, I don't want to just get rid of them just yet. But like you just mentioned, there's so many ways that you can put together, whether it's like new pieces, a second life, grinding it down, converting it into something else. Like this is still all very malleable and usable material that we just don't want it to just go to waste or end up in a landfill. Or like you said, if there's a way that you can repair it into a second life, there might be other communities that they're just like, hey, we're looking for shoes. I have a pair Literally, I can grab them right now. This is a pair of the tri sure. These are darn yeah. near still fresh. Yeah. There's somebody, a kid out there or an organization that can get the yeah. benefit out of them. You never They know buy them in bulk and then they... Re- I, one thing I learned was 75% of the world depends on the secondhand market, mm-hmm. which blew my mind. And as a designer, I think you probably... That blows your mind too, right? That it's not just living one life. Secondhand market is... When you go to Guatemala, I train there a lot as a runner. It's mm. they depend on the secondary market. In the US, we don't depend on it so much. But yeah. And I can roll off of that really Please. quickly. I know at least for us with D seventeen, we talk about, oh, we a lot of our design inspiration is very, I guess you could say vintage inspired. But then it sure. also is looking back, especially at least when I've been down to South Beach and the culture down there. It's a lot of resale stuff, a lot of buy, sell, trade, sneakers, clothing, stuff like that. Even my guys in Jacksonville at Collect Jacks, they built a whole brand and universe off secondhand collecting. It's all just old Jaguars football gear. Restoring it, yeah. Yeah. Some of it's not even restored. They take it with the holes and everything and people (laughs) are still interested in buying it. And I know for us, we've done a project with the Bowie Bay Sox. That's a minor league team under the Baltimore Orioles with my alma mater, Towson, in my high school. Yeah, did, I saw it on your Instagram. Yeah, we did that's like all. vintage. Yeah. yeah, that's my alma mater. And we did like vintage inspired pieces. And I always tell people, because obviously we can't probably have licenses and stuff like that. We just give them out. But I mm-hmm. always tell people, this is a, a free item or whatever, even if you purchase it or whatever. The thing about this is when I was going through that process, it wasn't necessarily the first life. It was more or less the second life. I'm like, this will definitely hopefully do you well in 20 years as it begins to break down and wear and stuff like that. Mm. Like the second life in fashion, like people will go a mile to find vintage Louis Vuitton or vintage Bottega Mm, and stuff like that, if it is resale or stuff like that on the vintage side. And I'm like, hey, if you're a reseller or something like that, it might not stand where it is now, but give it like 10 years when it starts to break down and it's still Mm -hmm. together and the the craftsmanship is still there. The graphic kind of looks naturally cracked. It's not like fake cracked, like we're going to fake wear and tear. I'm like, this is something that can be use not only when you buy it or when you go to resell it, it can get a whole nother life for a whole nother creator Mm -hmm. or whoever's wearing it. And I try to think about that now with a lot of stuff that I'm creating, especially with the running gear. Yes, we are making sure that we're making stuff, but we try not to make too much. We try not to overproduce any of the products. If it is anything like, for example, our singlets, we will have them for like retail, but not too many, but everything is made like made to order. I don't want to go out and order 150 singlets. I'm only going to use 20. Now we have all this material that's just been used and it's sitting Mm -hmm. around. We really try to focus on that. 
Yeah. Doing minor because, production instead of, you have to do 500 piece minimum and then you're just like huge inventory. Yeah. And being you're more able based to, on orders per yeah. quarter, orders per month or whatever. And being That's able really to- That's really cool. You can get that creative and that flexible. It's um, definitely a challenge, but yeah. it uh, it has its pros and its cons. But like I said, I'd much rather get people invested in buying things that they want and they mm-hmm. will use over time. And we do now put instructions on what to do with this stuff after, hey, you don't want it anymore. And I'm not like a solid man or, or like an Arteryx that can mm-hmm. afford to do a buyback program, but it's definitely, hey, here's some of the local organizations and stuff that we work with to do with the products. Hey, you can take it to out here. We also have leveling the playing field, which they they do athletic equipment collection. They also do some of the merchandise. So it's, hey, if you don't want your tank, you're single anymore. And if it's just going to sit in the closet, take it down here. There's kids that are participating in a uh, track and field or cross country. They would love to take the secondhand singlet trying to go from there versus just letting it rot and get mothballs in your dresser. <laughs> so it's also So that. that's coming with the original clothing now? Is that part of the messaging? Yeah. So that'll come up uh, usually like in the follow-up emails and we'll do blogs okay. and stuff as well. Yeah, just so you do education on the website and then through like email. Yeah. It hasn't been put out yet, but I, I guess I'm like teasing it now. Yeah, though, um, some companies have buyback or recycling programs or some type of other reusing valuable componentry. Yeah. I don't know. What to, I don't know what to do with it, but there's a company or, or yeah. a nonprofit that, know, that has a yeah. better inclination of what to do with it. I'd rather partner with them and be like, Hey, go check out, you know, whatever. And now we have you guys a sneaker impact. When I go to the runs and we conclude, yeah. I'm like, Hey, if you have any additional things, throw them into the box. Then they say, what did they do with the stuff? Here's all, here's you guys website. Here's a sneaker impact website. Here's yeah. a video. Here's everything that's going into it. And the people are, they become more inclined. They're like, wow, now I know what to do with my shoes after I've put my 200, 300 miles yeah. in. They're not exactly. just going to go sit in Oh, my they have corner. so much life. We get shoes with a mm-hmm. thousand miles that someone could still wear for years. Yeah. It's the way to go. It's it's people. Sometimes people just need one to walk around their community. 24% of kids don't have proper footwear in the world to prevent diseases. Mm. So it's a big number, 24%. Um, so yeah, that's really cool to, to, t- to chat with about how you're encouraging people with your brand and with your, to get more mindful about use and consumerism. Let's talk a little bit about psychology now, about sneaker culture which is totally different, but it should be merging the two <laughs> ideally, but it's just mm. the psychology of the sneaker drop, the psychology of fashion on consumer behavior. Where did this all begin? How powerful is it? What is your take on that whole subject? Yeah. One, that's a really deep dig because I feel like a lot of people overlook that, especially when it comes to me within the sneaker world, because I actually sat down with a site, like a board certified psychologist to talk about obviously sneaker drops, sneaker culture, how things have changed and essentially what that has grown into in terms of a business. But back to the question, it really just stems down, not only from, hey, obviously we have our running, we have our lifestyle shoes, we have cross training, stuff like that, depending on sport or or activity. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, sneakers are used for human necessity. But then it's also you really don't need shoes, but then it's also you do need shoes. That's what we spoke about in that article, especially in terms of how psychology has been built into the business with obviously like scarcity tactics, being able to understand like where those locations and opportunities arise when you want to do like collaboration marketing. Like obviously if you're a brand that's X, Y, and Z, what can you do from not only a business standpoint, but also from a marketing standpoint to say, hey, we can create sneakers and footwear that have a second meaning. It's more or less not just a new colorway of something. It's okay, this shoe like for example, in in Baltimore, Under Armour, like I said, I'm 20 minutes away from the H. It became not just a lifestyle, but it's almost like a cultural stepping stone. It's you grew up wearing Under Armour when you played Pee Wee football. You play wear Under Armour when you were in high school playing basketball. Depending on, let's say, you became a Division One athlete, you went to University of Maryland where Kevin Plank is an alumni. You may not have gone to the NFL. But now you've developed connections and networks, and it all started because of a sneaker. 
It also could be within the running journey, like it is in terms of the bigger brands with the collaborations. It's like being able to work, like we, like I mentioned, with nonprofits or grassroots organizations, and how you're able to take the product and implant it into something else mm-hmm. versus it just being like, hey, it's it's Adidas and Bad Bunny. Here you go. It more or less takes a second life because now all the Bad Bunny concert goers are wearing his sneaker. The sneaker is representative of Puerto Rican culture. It's understood in places like Miami, Los Angeles, Austin, Texas. It, it begins to take a bigger life than what it is versus it just being seen as just like nylons, glue, and plastic. The way that that not only sneakers, but product as well, hoodies, t-shirts and stuff. Yeah, we have brands that we wear, but these are the tribes that we're represented. These are the logos and monikers that we identify ourselves with and being able to see how that's grown into Mm -hmm. retail businesses, not only just by going to the mall, but also what's seen in fast fashion. Sometimes people relate more with the companies that they're buying from and how that speaks to themselves. How do you diversify two people, one that shops at Publix versus one that shops at Aldi? Mm -hmm. If you're going to buy fast fashion from Shein, are you going to buy the fast fashion from the mall? Is it online? Is it in person? It's so many different layers, how that's built up. And at least for me in the streetwear life, sometimes the psychology behind it is put like, hey, it's a collaboration. It's hype. It's It's hot at the time. Yeah. It's sought after, I guess you could say. But A lot of people don't understand that there's so many subcultures and Mm -hmm. ways of understanding, for example, streetwear. When it first began, like in New York, it was very underground. It was like if you saw somebody with a a Stussy t-shirt, you're just like, what the heck is that? But the people that were in the cultures of surfing and skateboarding and hip hop and going to the clubs at four in the morning in somebody's basement and everyone's wearing the shirt. And then as it becomes mainstream, it goes from being in the underground to now I want to be a part of the underground. This is me wanting to feel like my human necessity of being in a tribe. That's where it starts to become monetized and we're seeing it everywhere. Movies, video games, Marvel, cinematic conference releases and stuff. But then like you had mentioned before, it's a lot of people in the earth, which means it's a lot of material that needs to be used. It's a lot of shirts that need to be made. Not everybody's going to wear the same shirt. There's leftovers from a lot of things, right? From basketball tournaments where the team doesn't win and the national championship, they already have the stuff printed. Or it could be even the Chicago Marathon, which, you know, reached out to us when they had extra apparel left over from their event and they need to find a home for it Mm -hmm. and they wanted to maybe leave the area. Um, yeah, I have to stay in the area. Sometimes they want to stay, sometimes they want to leave. But it's just, it's interesting how, yeah, I think organizations are getting more and more mindful. It's just, I think that when there's a lot of money behind certain things like basketball tournaments, we should be more mindful than I think the so marathons are getting pretty mindful now. They're reducing mm. plastic usage everywhere. It's just really great to see. So now I think the next step is like all the other sports runners aren't the only, and the other sports are getting, you're seeing it in, hopefully in the Olympics and in pro mm. sports and hopefully in, in a lot of big brands too, that they're realizing to, to yeah. reuse the materials, like you said, for other purposes, like making hats out of, and it's just what, really yeah. cool ideas. It's whatever. And also I, from the ocean. Yeah. Just from recycled sources. Yeah. Adidas is doing thing. some stuff and on. Yeah. Yeah. I had a mini like project, whoever, I'll put it yeah. out there, whoever decides to do it, because I can't do it. I don't have the facilities to do it, but I mm-hmm. really think, it would be so interesting. I don't know what, like I said, I don't know what brand's going to do it. I don't know who's listening. If, if you get this far and listening, just send me the product or at least just put me in the campaign or something. I would love to see a brand because like I said, D17 can't do it right now. We don't have the facilities. Someone take all the water, all the plastic water bottles that are used during the marathons and stuff, mm-hmm. scoop them all up. And turn it into something. Yeah. I would love to see that because every even when I'm racing, obviously I'm trying to PR and stuff like that. Like when you pass like the hydration yeah. stations or like people bring their own stuff, they just kind of just toss it. But I'm like, it's just it's just sitting in the street. And then obviously someone has to come by and clean this all up. But I'm like, mm-hmm. obviously they're just gonna throw it away. But I'm just so curious. They're getting more. I think I heard something in Miami about they're starting to make 
something now out of the picked up materials from the marathon from yeah, all the bottles. I, need, I, I, yeah. I want to see something of that from all of it. Cause even when I was watching, uh, the, the women in the men's marathon for in mm-hmm. Paris, I was just like, man, they're just like us. They're just yeah. throwing it. <laughs> I wondered like how much well, we add up. Yeah. Collected. There are hundreds of lot. millions of runners in the U S I'm sure. Like yeah. U S is a runner. I don't know, but regardless, everyone uses water bottles. So there needs to be yeah. an industry for this. And I'm sure the fashion, yeah, guys, like anyone who wants to get involved, reach out to Terrence Diggs D 17. He <laughs> wants to be a leader in this. Like, I'm, get him the I, materials. I, might, I might even do it. The myself. R&D lab is going to get crank in there. He's going to, I I really yeah. might even just do it myself. I might yeah. just volunteer at an event. And reach out like, to one of the bigger. Yeah. I'm just going to keep, can I just keep the bottles? I don't Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to do, and well, I'm going to There's a lot of processing thing. involved, obviously. You got to, and the sterilizing or the yes, different, yeah. you got to reform it. Yeah. See, I don't have all that. So that's how it's like one of the big brands can just be like, we have the facilities to do it, but. We have the materials here for you to take when you come and visit us. Um, I'll show you some <laughs> of the, you can see on camera here, some of the things we make out of, we're starting to make flooring and Mm. cup coasters and we're making little doormats but we're now they're they made some fashion clothing for uh swimsuit models in miami beach yeah, for, it's actually at saint thomas university mm. and they had models wear evening wear that was made out of recycled shoes and yeah they taped it to their body it was interesting or they yeah. made it secured it was like a top I, cool I, so they're starting to make stuff just out of shoes I need um, that. Or yeah. when I start my, when I get my, my D17 location, preferably yeah. somewhere in Wynwood, I, I need the whole floor with all the, the grinded shoes. And then we'll get a nice little sneaker impact, I don't know, plaque on the floor being like, yep. this is made. Yeah. Really we were just talking about that today. Spray shoes. painting it on. Yep. Yeah. That'd be sick. We've sick. got our mural here, which Pedro Amos, a local artist, is going to be on later this week and in person. He did our mural. It's a little hard to see right now, but it says sneaker impact. Someday we'll have a three camera set up and Heck we'll yeah. have a big sweeping view when you're here. I'm working on a third <laughs> camera. Gotta um, love it. But it's pretty basic right now. But we just really wanted to get to know you today, Terrence. And I have a couple more questions before we close out, if you have a couple more minutes. Yeah, let's, um, let's talk about some of your favorites for sneakers and start in fashion, like what you love to wear the most or what you have the biggest attachment to. And yeah, just your favorite shoes. You can move on to running too as well after the fashion. Yeah, I guess right now, fashion wise, I'm looking at them. So thankfully, I, I can't forget. You, if you want to show us your collection quick or anything? Uh, not right now because it's right a mess. <laughs> no, your place um, looks great, though, to be honest. This is- thanks. Definitely, I will say, at least on the fashion side, I love wearing just A6 Kayano 14s. They're just good for me. They're just, um, they feel good on your feet. So more. Yeah, super meshy. Yeah. I love the I love New Balance 993s. That's just a local staple. Everybody that probably exists in between They're just clean. Baltimore, they just love those gray New Balances. Yeah, and at that. least now, I don't know if it's just me getting older, but I'm obsessed with Crocs now. I'm literally wearing them right now. I was expecting Crocs. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah, nah. I, if I'm not doing anything fun, I'm wearing But they the, feel so let's talk about sandals. For Do you know Ufos? I, I, I had Achilles surgery. So I right after surgery, I got a pair of Ufos because you're going to love TRE because you're going to see all the running brands there. Crocs isn't there, but every running brand is there from Nike to on to every company. You can Even all the new shoe companies. There's so many companies I hadn't even heard of. This would be my third year. So I try to make it to Austin this November if you can, and you can come and hang out with us and so many other people there. And it's a week of amazing opportunities, but yeah, I was just, okay. So back to the sandals, do you really like croc? I've never worn a pair in my life. I'm an UFOs fan slash diva. Mm-hmm. I don't know. And I love them because I've had a couple pairs and they just last for so long, probably more expensive, but they're just for a recovery. I've done 45 marathons. I'm 45 years old. Do Crocs feel as good on your feet as a really solid running recovery sandal? I, for me, they do, but I don't know if that's more or less just like the hype beast side of me. Cause these are you like, like the, the design aspect, all the colors, because yeah, these some are people the, running Crocs. I've heard of them running even I, fast miles or fast half marathons. Yeah, I'm not, like a one Oh three half marathon or something. In Crocs. Yeah. I'm not doing that, but, but I just, this one, yeah, I've heard of them, people running in them though. And they're ubiquitous. I've never worn a pair, but ubiquitous is a good word for Crocs, right? They're everywhere. Yeah. I only like what, these. What do you love about them? 
obviously these are like the like hype beast version they're from yeah, a the Bond or, ones. yeah, yeah. they're a collaboration with a, a black designer named Salehi Bembry. And I've always just been like a fan of his design language and everything. Cause like the bottoms of them, they're supposed to be like reminiscent. I messed them up, but they're supposed to be like a fingerprint. I like wearing them like whenever I'm at the races and I've stepped in 9,000 puddles of Gatorade and water. And then I look around, I see the little, my little fingerprint walking Liquor line. Yeah. Design but, elements very important to you. Yeah, more more or companies less. they're more basic in the design element. I think a company like Crocs just has so many iterations. Yeah, that- and depending on how which ones they are, like I don't mind just the basic ones too. But like I said, more or less my I guess you could say my ethos is still like a hype beast, so I still like to try to put on yeah, some, you know stuff. some type of flair to it. Those are I'm those okay. are Bright yeah, green. You know, I don't know if it's just like a thing, but I'm obsessed with like my running shoes always being extremely bright. I don't okay. know why. I literally am looking like a pair of Gel Nusa's la- the lime green, Kayano's lime green, Super Blast yeah. lime green, Maddox. I, I really love just bright shoes. Why do and companies I- do the bright colors on running? Is it? I know that there's reflective material for safety, but why do they do the bright colors? Is it to invoke a sense of Nike has that tennis ball green a lot. And- I don't know. I think for me growing up, I was always obsessed with it and I always can remember it. I was, this had to be 2012 Olympics yeah. when they, I think when they first started bringing out like the Nike Volt, I was like obsessed with it. I was like, oh my goodness, the red, white, and blue. And then they're just wearing these gigantic, loud, way off brand contrast colored cleats. And I, I think like low key, my brain has been obsessed with that kind of standout contrasty feel. And, and that kind of all ties back into my design life, being able to look back and pull the pieces together of my design language. Even a lot of people don't know, and I guess it's the perfect place to do it. The D17 logo literally is the same. It's like the Miami Heat logo. The wow. Loxy. Not this one. because that's the got motion one. to it though. It's the same yeah. feel because I was a big, I'm a big Heat fan. Even my colors yeah. are the red, white, black and well, gold so it's, it's the way to go yeah. that's i've always just pulled those things and now like when it comes to the business and putting together whether it's design uh, ideas or finding that inspiration i'm always like sticking to it so whether it's like from old sports stuff i liked like i said certain like olympic looks like i can remember stuff they wore after the 2012 when Team USA won gold in basketball, like the shirts they wore after the game. Like I said, the track and field, like I always understand what they're putting together when they had those bright Nike cleats. And then even this year, which was super cool, a lot of people didn't realize it and I didn't realize it either that Noah Lyles, when he won the 100, he wore a pair of the Adidas Audi Zero, but it was a collaboration pair with a Japanese brand called Wythe. So they're like a very high-end fashion brand and they collaborated on the track cleat. That's like something that I wanted to do like before it was a thing, but I find it interesting because like I said, the world of running and athletics before it was separated, but now it's slowly blending together. Even he had a Louis Vuitton chain on running track and even some of the other athletes, Shelly Ann, Frazier Price, she had a freaking Richard Milley watch on when she ran the really? 200 in the, in the prelims. Like she had a hundred thousand dollar watch on. That's it's cool to me. Really? I, some people, maybe some purists are like, ah, I would never do that. Yeah. Prize, I mean, they must have to get certain things vetted that they can wear chains. And I know cool. as a cross country coach, we, they used to not allow jewelry. Now they allow it, but the Olympics, you can't just wear covered in different. I know Nike has a big relationship in USA track and field, but yeah. Um, see me, you know, I, see, I'm a, there's I'm always a, rules and regulations. Yeah, that was me. I don't know if I was yeah. in Paris or going to LA, I would definitely have pulled something like that. I would have just been like, I'm, I'm sure. gonna wear this. I don't know, like when J.R. Smith, when he was on the Cleveland Cavaliers, he wore a Supreme shooting sleeve, and that just okay. set the world off. Sure. Supreme shot up, and it's oh my gosh, he's wearing streetwear when a professional. Mm-hmm. Was, I liked that. That really was like my catalyst to kind of getting in what I sure. wanted to do with like D17. Not saying I'm just gonna come and like mess everything up, but it's little small moments like that that like the running in me 
loved and also like the streetwear fashion purist also loved as well but it's no one really knew until they showed the cleat and i was like wait a minute i know that i know the brand they collaborated with so it's cool to see that and how it's happening and sure yeah the olympics time, was a big almost. stage yeah and I believe, 2028 should be fun yeah yeah the one in la is next mm-hmm. yeah i believe check back with look at the martu episode martu freeman about five episodes back she one of her clients was collaborating with the Barbados track team, I believe, for their kids. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so she, when you come down to Miami, I'm going to introduce you to Martu. She's the face of sustainable fashion in Miami. She oh, used to yeah. work for Polo Ralph. She worked for Ralph Lauren himself. So nice. With him for That's many amazing. Years in there. Yeah. So an invaluable resource down here and big sneaker impact fan. Um, so yeah, I want to kind of keep a couple more topics before we run out of camera strength here. <laughs> You got to figure out how to do these batteries that are, that you, I don't know what you call them, that you attach so you have extra runtime. Yeah. Runtime's about an hour 20, hour 10. So, what are some of your favorite things to do in Baltimore? And then I want to get to know you more as a runner. Baltimore, what's your favorite thing to do on a weekend or just on a night out? Baltimore, I'm going to an Orioles game. I'm going to Pickles Pub. I'm getting a hot dog. I'm going to watch the Orioles actually be great for one okay. time in my life. Uh, other than that, I've developed a new obsession with electric bikes. I love riding my bike now, especially now that the weather is decent. I ride my bike to the track, so I try to be a real local guy. Anybody that sees me, I'm just like, hey, if you see me on my bike, come run with me. They know where I'm going. Nice. They know the track that I'm going to. I even take the sneaker impact box. I try to wow. I strap it onto the back. No way. That's what yeah. I know. I put it sideways. Okay, and then I that needs to be documented. Yeah. I'll, I'll yeah, do it. Good. I just ride down the street, my little electric bike. So you're pretty close to the track? How far does it take you to get there? Probably like 10 minutes. I'm pretty close. On an electric bike. So it's got to be two miles and about, right? Yeah, about two ish miles. It's where it was. It's my where I went to high school, so it's pretty okay. pretty local. So, so you, live really in, like you live in you live in Baltimore still. So I'm located in like Howard County, Maryland, so like a little okay. bit outside right now. But like it's maybe two miles away. It probably takes me ten minutes. Oh, I just you're right there. Oh, yeah, I throw the bike on. I throw the bat uh, the box on the back of the bike, and I ride it up with me. And I usually ride my bike like anywhere, like any of the local runs. I'll just take my bike sure. with me. There's also a PT place I hear called rehab to perform. I ride my bike over there, get my little sessions in, That's ride my bike back home. Yeah. And then okay. also obsessed. Wear your with helmet hundred percent. I got in a bike accident last year in Miami is very, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, and it was my fault, but I've always worn a helmet and I had a helmet on last year and thankfully I didn't even hurt my head. I broke two ribs no. and yeah, I ended up running four marathons that year after coming back from rib broken ribs and I hurt my knee a little bit, but it, it all healed up fast, but it was mm. close. It was right in front of my office actually in daytime. And oh, I got no. hit by a truck and I just hurt my ribs, not my head. Jeez, but I had a helmet on and I have, there's just a lot of bike accidents and motorcycle accidents out there. And I have a friend who's got, he builds motorcycles and mm. art ones and he works for us here at Sneaker Impact. And I said, you got to get every time I have to have the helmet on. I don't care what you think you look like. I lost a friend last year in a motorcycle accident and he and had a kid and it was just, you don't want to have to lose anyone. So just protect your brain when you're out there on the bikes is all I, the dad of, I'm a high school coach. I have to see mm. this is, <laughs> no, it's all good. I don't have any kids. So just make sure to wear that helmet. Cause we value your brain and yeah, we need nah. it for all the collaborations that are coming up. So tell us about what are you training for next? What's your big, next big goal? Yeah. So right now with charm city run working in training for the Charles Street 12 miler. That's just a straight 12 mile shot from Baltimore County to Baltimore City. So we'll be starting, which is very like a hometown run for me because it's outside of Towson. And then it goes all the way straight down to the 20K. Yeah, because I've done a 20K once or twice. That must be. Yeah. So me and my one of my teammates, we're going to do the relay. So we're going to split it, split the distance. That should be fun. And we'll kind of see how it goes. He's trying to get into the longer distances. I'm trying to train for Baltimore Run Fest, which is in October. That's how you're going to do? Yeah, I'm going to do the half. That's your first half? So you're more of like a 5K mile guy or what what, what, what was your favorite distance in the past? Definitely like a 5K. Okay. Uh, five five k ten k was like my bread and butter. Um, but I really want to tackle the half. I did the ten k for Baltimore uh, two years in a row. 
the half, I feel like my next step. Um, but then I really want to start getting into the the full marathon space. So that's definitely probably going to be next year, I'm hoping. Yeah. But now that I've gotten through a lot of my half marathon training, I yeah. think the 12 miler should be cool to give me a little bit, okay, that is what it's like running in the city with my pace and my new training. And now in October, yeah. when I do the half, it should be, I'm hoping for smooth sailing. But <laughs> yeah, you're doing it the right way. You're building up from shorter distances to longer. And the marathon is quite a bit more than training for the half. Yeah, you're ready for that because it is a full time job and it's harder to go really fast to get the speed in the marathon. But for the 5K and 10K, you can still run pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, what's sure. your favorite food to eat after a run? And yep, yeah, that's my next question. Post run meal. Yeah. So with the run club, we were going to ramen a lot. Okay. I don't, I don't know why, but we were like, I had that the other day. Ramen. Yeah. We're going to ramen. It's a ramen place. It's like right next Not to Not bad, actually. Before. Getting so much sodium, you really need to replenish the sodium after you run. Yeah. But see, you have a it, beer with it or something. Yeah. But that was my problem. At least when I got into running, I'm like, man, I just ran a, a 10K. I think I deserve ramen, a beer, sushi, <laughs> a side order. I'm like, okay, I don't think I need yeah. to eat that much, but we definitely. It's part of the community. Need, yeah, you gotta definitely the ramen. Socialize is here and there when you can. Gotta love it. But, but yeah, all the ramen. run clubs now are partnering up with all the great Beer. places to eat and drink. So yeah, that's Sound cool. Good. What's your favorite nutrition on the run? Do you use anything while you're training right now? Or do you eat anything beforehand that is a go-to, like a peanut butter sandwich or anything? I'm a big honey stinger guy. Okay. I like, I like a good, for me, it's always a honey stinger and just... Well, this might sound nasty, but like just salt water, like really just like pink salt, just water and just, just shake it well, up. Yeah. I, I try you to say salt to the game. coffee. I tried that in the last year. Come out of the sea salt to your coffee. Yeah, yeah. I've been trying to, to do that. I could add it to water. There's a lot of electrolyte mixes too and just things. Yeah, I'm just weird. I just like that straight, just like pure salt. It's so awkward. Okay. I don't know why. So just some sea salt to some filtered yeah. water and call I it just, a day. And just shake okay. it up for some reason. Yeah. I don't know why, but I like the Gatorades and like Powerades and stuff like after. But if I'm doing anything mm -hmm. like before or during, I don't know why, but it like messes me up. It just okay. does not work for me. Just straight water and salt, a good old, yeah. good old carb load, some Olive Garden night before okay, and go from there. So shout out to them and their unlimited bread and salads because I'll sit there and eat bread and salad for an hour. And then <laughs> just uh, That's the before, original right? fuel system. It's the way yep. to go, man. Shout out yeah, to Olive Garden. There's <laughs> carb base, there's fat burning systems, there body definitely adapts. Everyone's a little different. So it's mm. just do what works best for you. And that's good to know that you're getting your electrolytes in Miami. We have to, I focus on electrolytes a lot because all the time I, I'm sweating right now. It, it's about 90 degrees outside. And even in the studio, it's in the eighties. <laughs> yeah. From a person that's from yeah. up North and actually yeah. going down there because I was living, I was yeah. in, like I said, I was in Jacksonville, I was in Orlando, Tampa, Miami. I just been bumping around. I yeah. am not used to the heat. They were yeah. laughing at me when I was in Jacksonville because I was legitimately drenched. They're like, sure. yo, they're like, yeah, it's 91. This is nothing. I'm like, oh my wow. goodness, I cannot do this. I'm dying. <laughs> Even when I went to Miami for the first time, I was like, yeah, it is humidity really is freaking hot. Here. We I'm have like, the one of the most humid. Atlanta's humid, Jacksonville is humid, but Miami is humid. And I'm from like Chicago and Southern Wisconsin, which is humid as well. But there's other places in the US that aren't humid, but Miami is humid. Jamaica is only the place that could only be more humid than us, or Puerto Rico. I've been to both. And when you get off the plane in the Bahamas or in Jamaica, it's gonna be a little more humid than Fort Lauderdale or Miami, but that's the only place you can go that unless you go to the jungle. But yeah. we are here, so it's just it's you got to get used to it. And it, as a runner, it takes a couple of years, at least one whole year of just in the summer times, you go out towards sunset more or before 9 a.m. like it's in the morning. So you can get five or 10 miler in and not have to, you can't do more than five in the middle of the day. It's too hot. It's just a yeah, long run. I, I couldn't do it. That and getting a, getting a different shower head. Because when I tried to take a shower down there with that hard water, I was like, oh my goodness. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, no, we can fix that. Yeah, the shower, it, that must have been, you just need softer water probably. Yeah, um, that was, but yeah, I was it's not ready for it. The Miami Marathon and yeah, to get to know you better in person and we'll connect <laughs> yeah. you. When you want to do an event down here, just reach out and we're happy to 
to um, introduce you to a couple. Uh, An just did a big race the other day called the Squad Race, and that mm. was in Design District. And Winwood nice. has a bunch of special events, and a bunch of my friends have run clubs that we can get you yeah, out to. I need to pop down. You have to there. check out the Late Night Menu Crew there in Winwood, and they are the, the founder was on the podcast a couple months ago, and he's a really cool dude. So yeah, we'll get you out to all these cool scenes. And but yeah, how about what's the what, what's coming up in the future for you? Like after the summer, is there any? What's the next season look like? Any future goals you want to chat about, real quick? Yeah, really just, I guess you could say on the business side, just getting stuff together for our next kind of full running collection, putting together yeah. like some of the performance stuff, some of the lifestyle stuff. We've been working with a couple of retailers as well, both domestic and international. So I'm hoping we can get some stuff. The goal right now is to do some stuff over in Korea. So that should be cool. And then getting some events just like together for the end of the year, like we had mentioned. Obviously, my own training and helping others train and get into it. And then just like on mm -hmm. a personal note, I always try to say this a lot on any interview I do, just self-care, getting my mentals together. I know a lot of people, I'm on LinkedIn a lot. It's a lot of people getting laid off and job changes and life changes and being able to keep the head clear. I sure. use running a lot for my own self-care, even if it's like a, a small, and I, I don't have to go at an eight minute pace today. I can go and just to get my mind off stuff, get outside. And like I mentioned before, entrepreneur life, I do a lot of time sitting in this chair. So it helps yeah. me get up and get my vitamin D, make sure that I'm getting my water intake in and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, just finishing the, the year out strong, getting things back into the equilibrium and together and getting outside, man. I'm ready. I'm ready Touching to race. Grass. Yeah. That's what they yeah. say. Whenever you get too honed into something, whether it's social media or technology or work or whatever you got, or your passion, you got to also remember to go touch grass. Yeah. And I'm ready. I'm ready to race. I know fall's coming. My birthday's yeah. in the fall. I need, I need some bibs and running fast through some cities. I've been waiting yeah. to get oh, the, the fall is the best time because the weather starts cooling down all these great half marathons and marathons around the country. When you're ready for the marathoning world, I've done a, a couple of good ones in AM and have you my hit list. I'm going to Valencia this December for my next, if I can be healthy enough. I'm not able to do a longer run than 10 miles right now because of the. I'm trying to get back to longer runs. But I wanted to ask you really quickly, how would you define, your, we didn't get to this question, how would you define your personal mentality as an entrepreneur and community leader? Like how would you categorize, like type of, would you categorize your mentality? I would say if, if it's a mix of both, I would say I'm very stubborn, but strategic. <laughs> okay. One of your interviews earlier that you like, you're like me where you aren't shy to get an answer. Like you're going to reach out, you're going to ask for yeah. something in order to I, get it. I've gotten in the point, at least entrepreneur wise, I know that there's an answer somewhere because uh, I'm not the first one to do it. So mm -hmm. somebody definitely knows. i um, not saying I'm going to be like, hey, if you're trying sure. to push, but. Which is stubbornness. <laughs> yeah. And I think as well, like I said, strategic, I really feel that I'm just in at the core. I think I'm just like a cool dude. So yeah. it's just, it's being able to be like, Hey, if I can help you with this, we can work on this together. I'm not afraid really of any collaboration. I'm not afraid yeah. of or just have a discussion and yeah. yeah. Cause like I said, there's a, there's so many things that are happening, especially like in the running world, like we've seen Banded and Asics, we've seen Satisfy and Hoka, like you never would have thought two running brands would be working together on something. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to always be product or event. Like I said, I've collaborated with baseball teams. We do run stuff. If the baseball team sure. wants to do like a 5k event, let's do something together. If it's not necessarily on the run side, I've connected with people that they make electric bikes. It's still health and wellness. I still would love to be able to see where those lines can be bent or changed. Mm -hmm. I would do a, I would do a collaboration with a credit union, a bank <laughs> or something. It's cool bank apparel or something, but let's talk about a class with like financial literacy and ways to get a business loan and stuff like that. Sure. Because I feel, and I don't know, I, I don't want to sound like a philosopher and I tell people this all the time. I'm not a guru. I'm just a guy that just was too stubborn to take a no. I've always been trying to use my platform, whether it is the business or personal to just expose and give 
awareness of things that I wasn't necessarily awarded with. I wish I ran a lot younger. Like I said, I played all these sports. I played lacrosse in high school. I didn't start until I was 16. I was a junior. I, sure. It was varsity or bus. I made yeah. varsity. I was able to grow into the game, but I didn't learn about it until I was about to graduate. Well, you could have a kid. Yeah, or as I loved that tenure. Yeah, it's ex- some- yeah, it's expensive. Yeah. And it's an expensive sport to play. Like I played golf oh, too. I got sure. lucky that my parents were able to afford to get me clubs and stuff, but I didn't start mm-hmm. playing until I didn't start playing until my freshman year. I just showed up with a set of clubs and I was like, I'm here to try out. So I try to always tell people like, man, I wish I knew about this sooner. I wish I knew more about running and, and, and because sure. I was a sprinter when I ran track, I didn't. You know, I was like anything over four hundred. I'm like, yeah, no, nah, yeah. I'm not. It's doing an evolution. That. I'm a high school coach for cross country, and it's an evolution in how people develop in their lives. And nothing happens before it's time. We do have high schoolers that once in a while run, want to run a marathon, like one or just want to do the shorter distances until they might get in their late twenties. And then they start doing longer distances with their friends. And then when they're in their 30s, they're waking up at 5 a.m. to meet the run club at 6 a.m. and Mm -hmm. run 15 miles or whatever. And they would have thought they were crazy when they were 18. But when they're 30, they're much needed mental health and social interaction and just work-life balance. If you would have told them that when they were a teenager, they would have thought you're because their mind wasn't in that place yet. And Mm -hmm. to them, that seems like such a long distance, but it doesn't as we become more used to that some people are running 200 miles in a weekend for all or longer yeah. or a hundred. Um, there's just so much diversity in the world that it's, it's just, but I, I think what it comes back to is encouraging health and mentoring people and, yeah. um, and design can do that. And it comes back to athletics, design, and community. I keep saying those three words, which are your core pillars for D17. Yeah. So that's all I- and design coming together. Those are two very different worlds. Yeah. Um, athletics is pure competition, spirit, design is more art, but athletics is art too. It can have function, athletics has function. So and then community, that's really a big overarching theme. Yeah. Uh, health, uh, health, physical health. I it's like the A6 has you know, a sound mind and body right in there. Let's close out. I think it's time and we want to give a shout out to, do you want to give any shout outs and any also links to share? This would be the same. quick shout out. Yeah. Actually. Honestly, if you want to reach out to me, just everything is just D17 Terrence, just the letter D, number 17, T R A N C E. Check out the website, d17clothing.com. That's connected to everything from if you want to buy apparel, if you want to see a run club calendar, if you want to hang out there. Obviously, shout out to my homies. Shout out to Jimmy Butler. Shout out to, <laughs> shout out to ASICS. Shout out to Sneaker Impact. And it's still a whole lot of things to do. And something in this world brought us together to do this interview for me to get this box. Shout out to you guys for just popping up and sending multiple boxes. So now I get Did you get eight? We usually ship eight at a time in a case. Yeah. I thought I would get just one. I didn't really know that it was just like, hey, just send the address and it just pops up. I was like, wait a minute. So it's, if anybody- yeah, Sometimes it's hard for us to guess. We can ship one, but it's like the same cost to ship eight, basically, I think. To all of our store partners, we ship eight at a time. We have a new poster that we just got laminated that is an mm. infographic that I helped create that shows the recycling journey in about mm. seven to eight steps. So it explains in, in photos with some text. And I'll, I'll try to get you one of those um, to, with your next case. Um, we're getting a feet first. We'll get one very mm. soon. So yeah, we just sure. came out last week, but we're trying to do so much to educate. A lot of it's visual. We're on Instagram every single day educating. And so are you. So thank you so much. We're going to have you down here in the studio. Please plan a trip to Miami. Let's make it happen for January or February. That's Heck a great yeah. time to come down or December. Anytime in mm-hmm. the December through March period. We, my, The founder has a season tickets to the Miami Heat. So it's a natural fit. We'll take you to the Heat. It's a done deal. Him and his son. It's his son's birthday today. They're the biggest Heat fans in the world. So we'll get you. They've got some courtside tickets. And they get to actually refer. They, they're like honorary referees sometimes. They did the coin flip. Like they get really involved. They, you'll probably get to meet some of the players. Look, so we also will. Ryan, don't get me place. started. Don't get me started. I'm telling you, we they're the biggest dream. Miami Heat fans here. I'm actually originally a Milwaukee Bucks fan because I was born in Madison and lived there for 30 years. 
So mm-hmm. I went to the the Bradley Center back in the 80s where nice, it was like nice. you would fall out of the, if you stood up in your chair, it was mm-hmm. straight down to the floor, like straight down. I don't even know how we got into those seats. It's not even the current stadium. That was same thing with the Brewers. We used to go to County Stadium. And now they got the Cole Madison. We got the Cole Center, I believe. But now they got Miller Stadium for the Brewers, and the Brewers yeah. are Packers are a big deal. But I've become a Miami sports fan because I've lived here for 16 years. So I remember when Shaq came down here, and I was working in a restaurant at the time when the big news hit. And it, I'm sorry, not Shaq. I did watch when Shaq played LeBron when LeBron came to Wade and and they formed the big. There was just so many things to talk about on this podcast. We could keep like I them. said, Mo, if you're listening. I have a Dwayne Wade fat head that was in my childhood room. It's still oh, yeah. there from 2007. It's still on the wall. I've yeah. thrown a first pitch at a baseball game. If they bring me down, I'll flip the coin. I will train this thumb to go. To- <laughs> You'll take the half court shot. Yeah. I'll take a free throw. I need yeah. this championship. The bubble hurt me. I guess the Spurs <laughs> hurt me. I guess yeah. the Nuggets hurt me. I cannot do it again. I, I've been yeah. to. I've only been to one game before, but I was really high up there. You, you were at but, the Heat. Though. Yeah, I actually, American I, Airlines. I think now it's called the Kaseya Center. Yeah, I was there. They played the Nuggets. It was a regular season game, but I yeah. think it was like right before the playoffs. And they got blown out. So I was like. I'm ready. Oh Look, gosh. I remember I love- when the when the blimps used to hover over and I'd be out for a run and running before the finals, like the same day, you know, I would go out for like my eight to ten mile run. I'd run down the Venetian Causeway, which takes you to Miami. And yeah, I would see all the blimps over the stadium because LeBron and D Wade and Udonis and all the legends were, you know, playing. It's, it's how it goes. LeBron yeah. would go out and train. He would run with D Wade. They'd run their six milers. And Ray Allen, I, I got involved with a couple of organizations he worked with. So just the the, the legends are are actually involved in the community down here. Like Alonzo yeah. Morning, you know, um, in the local high school. I used to live by his high school. That him and his wife have a have an amazing track and high school center. And they're the Alonzo Morning, I believe it's called school for you got a great thing going down here and all the sports legends do uh it's really cool to see how miami is developing into more than just a a kind of place people come to party it's also becoming a sports and arts center so yeah man the welcome open invite terrence to come see us guys it was an honor today to get to interview terrence so terrence thank you for your time and uh, we'll stay in touch have a great rest you too all right guys have a good day